Thank you, Aidgun, for pointing out to the challenges for the societies when there there is uh, well sh differences between the, the genders. Aidgun will now join the the, the panel, and uh, we have here um, three other speakers, uh, which is Miss Katrin Björg Rikardsdottir, who is a director at the Center for Gender Equality in Iceland. And we have uh, Eirikur Björn Björgvinsson, who is a mayor of Akureyri in Iceland. And uh, Michael, unfortunately, couldn't make it, so uh, Olafur Ellefsen is replacing him, and uh, he's at the Center of Gender Equality here in Faroe Islands. Yes. So these people have three, the other three have three minutes each to uh, the short introduction to respond to these uh, issues. And to the audience, you should be prepared for the opportunity, I hope, afterwards to, to raise some questions uh, uh, as well. So, um, Katrin, you could start, please. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah, okay. Uh, the conference Gender Equality in the Arctic, Current Realities, Future Challenges, was held in Akureyri, Iceland, in October 2014, with 150 participants representing various stakeholders from all member states of the Arctic Council. The main objective was to promote an extensive policy-relevant dialogue on gender equality, putting current realities and future challenges into context with climate and environmental changes, as well as economic and social developments. Another goal was to raise decision-makers' awareness of the situation of women and men in the Arctic and to strengthen cooperation among different people working with gender issues. The conference addressed various topics and throughout a consist consistent theme uh, of diversity uh, emerged, highlighting the importance of recognition and approval of diversity in terms of discourses, gender, people, education, economic, economics, social realities and balanced participation in leadership and decision making, both in the public and the private sector. The Arctic states have all emphasized the need for wide and active participation of local residents, regional governments and civil society organizations in discussion and decision making about future developments in the circumpolar north. Furthermore, several of the Arctic states place emphasis on gender issues in their foreign policy and work actively on promoting gender equality in their international work. Despite this, there is an inherent gender imbalance in the ongoing policy discussion and decision making about the Arctic. As women are underrepresented in Arctic governing bodies, uh, administration, businesses and science. The geopolitical and global economic significance of the Arctic region is growing inter alia, a consequence of climate change, accelerated resource development and prospects for trans-Arctic uh, shipping. Although generalizations should be avoided, given the cultural and social diversity of the North, economic development throughout much of the region seems to be affecting men and women differently. It is a cause for concern that future developments in the North may for the most part focus on traditional male sectors such as oil and gas, mining, shipping and tertiary industrial development. Disproportionate outmigration of adult female females characterizes many rural areas of the Arctic, primarily as a result of diminishing employment and lack of educational opportunities for women. The resulting sex ratio imbalance negatively affects the resilience and development of the Arctic communities, many of which are seeing very high death rates for males, especially from external causes. If we want sustainable communities in the Arctic, we need to think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, one of which is to achieve gender equality. Gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing the experiences from the workshop that was held in Akureyri in 2014. We just continue down the, the, the line here with Olafur, who is a colleague in the similar center in Toshan, I guess, to, to what Catherine is leading in Reykjavik. Please. 
your Thank reflections. You. Thank you. Like a rock star. The, um, the question asked at this uh, plenary session is how to best promote gender equality and diversity in the Arctic through policy and practice. Um, if we start by the most obvious reasons why we must tackle gender inequality are that they, they are moral, ethical and human. How can we justify having half of the region's population being treating, treated less fairly than the other half? Addressing gender inequality is first and foremost a question of fairness, but beyond fairness it's also a question of economic performance. As was said before, the Arctic is a diverse region, both culturally, economically, and when it comes to gender equality. There are parts of the Arctic where traditional ways still rule, and there are parts of the Arctic that have embraced the modern age. If we look globally, Iceland ranks first for gender equality for the 90 year running, with Norway, Finland, and Sweden closely behind. The United States, Canada, and Russia rank much lower, and Greenland and the Faroe Islands, not being sovereign states, are not ranked at all, but my gut feeling is that our numbers would be dismal. For good and bad, the Faroe Islands sits smack between traditional and modern. I can go fishing or knit traditional sweaters in the morning, develop cutting-edge cutting edge software, or sit here and speak about gender equality for an international audience in the afternoon, and go scuba diving or make dinner for the family in the evenings. In many ways, it's a society full of opportunity, but to some extent, the traditional ways are holding us back when it comes to gender equality, and that needs to change. Here in the Faroe Islands, women still earn much less than men. The total salaries paid to men is almost 60% more than the amount paid to women. And at the same time, women spend 60% more time on unpaid work, primarily in the home. This is reinforced by the parental leave system, where fathers are only allocated four weeks of parental leave, while mothers get 14 weeks in addition to the 30 weeks that the, they supposedly should agree on splitting, but in practice, the total uh, is 93% of the weeks that end up with the mothers, and only 7% for the fathers. Why is this a problem? Well, the result is that women are funneled into the primary care provider role, where they remain for the rest of their lives. Men are funneled into the, into the role of breadwinners, but relinquish rights to their children, and the children do not have access to both parents. Gender stereotypes are so ingrained that even with a supposedly gender equality-friendly government, it is next to impossible to get legislators to allocate parental leave evenly to men and women with the latest change only six months ago actually increasing the, the divide. Gender equality does not happen by itself. It requires the collective action of human rights defenders, political will, and tools such as legislation, gender mainstreaming, statistics, and audits. Gender equality is a critical ingredient of any strategy for durable, resilient, and inclusive growth. And countless studies have confirmed that gender equality is great for business, and it's great for the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf and Thank you for stepping in on the short notice. So that, that is very appreciated. And thank you for sharing uh, those perspectives from the, the Faroe Islands. We started with a politician and we end, end up this introductory part with a politician. And we look forward to hear the reflections of Erik Gurbjörn Björgvinsson, who is the mayor of uh, Akureyri, Iceland. Please. 
Well, uh, Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can say that I'm a half a politician because uh, I've actually pointed out as a mayor, but I'm not from any uh, from any party. So, well, uh, first let me start with by saying it's uh, it's an honor for me to be here uh, with you today, and I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity or pleasure to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, my municipality and uh, when it comes to. Uh, uh, gender equality and what we have accomplished when it comes to gender equality. Uh, and uh, I want to give you a glance of what uh, ways to influence gender equality in, in municipalities. Uh, Akureyri is maybe not uh, a big municipality on a global scale with only 19,000 inhabitants, but when it comes to gender equality, we are quite big, even though I say so myself. And we are uh, one of the pioneers in Iceland in integrating gender equality into our policy structure, our political goals, and into our every days of control. We, for example, we are, for example, one of the first municipalities in Iceland to have special, uh, special, uh, a special gender equality director, to have a special gender equality board, and to have a special gender equality action plan. But the most important thing is that gender equality is a very important matter for all municipalities. All municipalities have to be active. We have to take responsibility and we have to take as an important issue and take it seriously. And I'm going to try it within my three minutes to go through several ways which uh, can influence gender equality in the municipality. We call it a checklist for administration of the municipalities. And it actually comes here for what I call a my Bible in gender equality. And uh, if you would like, you can have, have a glimpse in, in it. Of course, it is in Icelandic, but we can, of course, help you to, to translate it. But first of all, approach gender equality work in such a way that it is important part of municipalities' work, benefiting all inhabitants. Ensure, secondly, ensure that the municipality has gender equality action plan according to law, as we have in Iceland. Thirdly, support active follow-up on goals and actions involved in gender equality action plan. It's very important. Fourth, ensure that gender equality action plan is well introduced and accessible. Number five, Encourage the, uh, the, the signing and implementation of the European Charter for Equality of Women and Men of Local Life. Ensure that all statistics in gender uh, analysis according to law. Support that all important policy making goes through gender impact assess assessments. Apply gender mainstreaming during all steps of decision making process. Keep a close eye on the individuals of both gender are involved in decision making as political representatives in administration and consultation. Support that all methods of gender budgeting are put into use. Support a discussion in the community about gender equality by initiating meetings and courses. Pay an attention to equal op opportunities regarding all rules of municipalities. Democratic role, role of service providers, role of as, as an employee, role as an uh, allocating finances, and role of leadership in the community. Be conscious of equality in service and ensure that services is of all use for all inhabitants, regardless of gender. Prevent gender discrimination when the municipality serves as an employer. Ensure that jobs are not divided into men's or women's work and that salaries and rights are the same for comparable work. Ensure that the municipality actively works on prevention against violence as well as on increasing the safety of inhabitants. And number 16, work on developing a collaboration with the police and to tackle domestic violence. I have the opportunity uh, on the breakout session later on to go mo into more details, but 
that's my uh, what I wanted to say in the start on, on in the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Erik. That was quite a recipe for en ensuring and promoting gender equality. And I feel I had to stand up because I couldn't see people properly. We have a quite a short time for, for questions and I ask the audience to also, uh, if you have any, to, to give a signal. But something struck me here, being a Sami person myself and very um, occupied with traditional activities and so on. And Olaf, you said that that um, you felt that the traditional life, you were in between the traditional life and the modern life and the traditional activities and role um, patterns of the role of Munster, you know, uh, are hindering the gender equality. Uh, could you apply that kind of... Um, what hinders Far East to apply such a recipe list that uh, Akureyri here presented? It's only, it's only willpower or, or uh, just agreeing on doing it. I think we have a wonderful life here mm. and I, I think we can still retain it. But I guess that we need to change some of our ways. Yeah. Is it the challenge to get the local politicians on board, do you feel? Yes, I think politicians, but also the general public. Mm. I, I guess that getting a consensus in the, in the population that this needs to change, I think mm. that is still a struggle here. Yeah, yeah. Edgar, you are a politician here in Iceland, and you just have presented a, a gender equality plan. Do you have you looked into Iceland and how they have been working on this, and how do you how do you think you would implement this at the in the Faroe Islands, in the municipality level. It will probably get on. Yeah. Um, we have looked uh, to all the Nordic con countries and, and have made a, a plan with some uh, uh, initiatives that are, are made to our culture, mm. I think. But uh, uh, also similar uh, in some ways to what the other Nordic countries do. But in Iceland, you have come so far <laughs> far, far longer than we uh, we are, but uh, but now that we are starting and have a five years plan that is is is, is ongoing, and I hope that uh, it will be ongoing also after the next five years. I think we can move maybe very fast into Faroe Islands because, as Ella says, it's only to be agreed to agree uh, to do these things. Uh, but we are very divided into modern and traditional. Mm. Uh, I, I could add, uh, he mentioned earlier the paternal leave that uh, even a gender friendly government, I thought he said, uh, couldn't, uh, wouldn't, uh, the parliament wouldn't give fathers uh, more than two weeks, I think it was uh, in paternal leave. And that that's a fact. Uh, that shows uh, how how divided we are in some ways because uh, it's also new with uh, many women in politics mm -hmm. in the parliament. Now we are 30 percent. It became it in 2015. So everywhere in the Faroe society, you can see this splitting between modern and and traditional. I think, but it's only a question of time mm -hmm. that it's moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, we look forward to see the development. Katrin, you have been you are now at the Gender Equality Center in Reykjavik. Have you been impacting or working hard to get Iceland to adopt this kind of policy or did the politicians come up with the idea themselves? Well, sometimes uh, uh, lawmaking is progressive and uh, but I think the case for Iceland uh, uh, I can imagine that uh, the paternity maternity law uh, in 2000 was very progressive and that changed the mindset of Icelanders. Uh, so politicians, either if they are influenced from uh, gender equality bodies or not, they can be progressive and they should be uh, to help us change society to the way we want it to look like. Uh, and since I mentioned this uh, maternity paternity leave law, uh, when it came into effect in the year 2000, uh, men, uh, fathers, started to looking at this as their right. They had, they had the right to stay with their child for three months. The mother had a, a right to stay with the child for three months, and then the, there were these three months to share. In the beginning, uh, a lot of men 
took the opportunity because there was no roof in pay. Mm. They, they ha had the same uh, salaries that, like they had at work, but later it changed, unfortunately. But the bottom line, bottom line is lawmaking and setting a strategy can be very progressive and change mindset. Mm. Something struck me here, Eirik, uh, hearing what the Faroese people say here. So Iceland being, or Akureyri also being so good in implementing these gender issues and for, for kind of forcing it through. But you, don't you face this challenge with uh, traditional um, values and traditional livelihoods? Or is Iceland turned out to be a total modern society with, with distance to the traditional livelihoods? No, of course. We have our problems, of course. Well, uh, it actually comes uh, with uh, the responsibility that uh, everybody takes. And uh, it goes so far back. And we have been going for a long time, and it has taken a long time for us to be where we, where we stand today. And uh, the thing is, we have had a huge discussion in Iceland about uh, gender equality. And uh, the discussion is always good. And we are allowed to talk with all, all aspects. Everything is on the, on the table and bring everything on the table and discuss it, not keep it uh, under the table. Uh, and that's why I said that's when you get uh, progress and that's when you get f forward. So the thing is, of course, in, in a lot of countries that uh, these, those issues about gender equality, they are not allowed to be discussed. And, but uh, we were there, uh, well, 20, 30, 40 years ago but we have managed to be where we are today, and we are very, very, very proud of it. And we are, of course, a role model for, for others, and, and, and that's a, a huge thing for us. Yeah, definitely. So are there some questions from the audience? It's a very quick one. Here in the middle, uh, can't see from here, sorry. <laughs> They are also mobile. Yeah. Good. Hi. Uh, Björn Samuel is a member of parliament. Um, this question about earning money that the women in Faroe Islands earn only a third of the income and the men uh, two thirds. And that uh, I think amongst the millionaires there are <laughs> very few women. Uh, and uh, I have a question. Do anyone in the panel know how this is compared to other countries in the Arctic region? Is this a like something which is not specific for the Faroe Islands, uh, and uh, does anyone in the panel know what to do about it? Thank you. And while uh, someone is answering here, there is a call for the floor on the furthermost back uh, bench towards the wall. So who will try to answer that? I will try Catherine. to answer, but I don't have the answer, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not sure that there has been a survey on, uh, especially for the Arctic, uh, on the wage gap, gender wage gap, but it would be very interesting. So I encourage <laughs> researchers here in the room uh, to make such a survey. Uh, and also, well, let's take a look then what we can do and what, what, what's the root of it. Um, we know that all over, or generally, uh, there is a gender pay gap. And it's, it's connected also uh, to the unpaid work that women are taking on, family responsibility, gender segregated labor market, and so on. So there are, there are a lot of variables in that. But please, let's do this kind of survey. Yeah, and Erik. Well, I don't, under, uh, uh, don't have the answer to that question, but I can uh, tell you that every two years, we go through the salaries of what we actually pay in the municipality, just to be sure that we pay equal uh, salaries for equal jobs. And we do it, as, as I said, every two years. And a lot of municipalities in Iceland do that. And because when one municipality comes forward and says, we are doing this, everybody follows. So that's important to be, to have everything on the table, to discuss it, as I said earlier. Thank you. And then it was a question there behind. I can't even, we can't even see you there. It's, it's on. Thank you. Uh, my name is Juliet Newson. I'm from the Iceland School of Energy at Reykjavik University. Um, and actually the last question uh, kind of has, has, uh, relates to my question. 
and that's that we hear so much about justifying uh, gender, gender equality action, and it seems to me that it's still based on uh, very basic gender statistics that are collected at a national level. And I was wondering if there's any uh, movement to uh, standardise much more uh, finer and more specific gender data among the Arctic nations. So, it, it, you know, it, you can really identify problems a lot better and identify actions. Uh, is, is there any, any um, plan for this or, or monitoring um, efforts that go into finer, finer and more specific gender data in the Arctic nations? Well, I don't know the answer to that because I'm just a chair. Is there anyone who wants to uh, respond to that? Well, not, not to my knowledge, uh, no. But again, another good idea. I think we should do that. Good. Uh, we are running, because we lost a bit of the time in the beginning, we, are, uh, we have to start to wrap up uh, the discussion, but uh, the last, I would like to give you a 30 second reflections on, uh, we heard already good ways to do things, we heard about challenges and we heard about the importance of focusing on gender equality in order to ensure sustainable Arctic societies. So any third, 30 second uh, concluding reflections on what would be smart to do next. So maybe if we start with Eric at the end, uh, since you were last earlier. Well, I actually wanted to use this opportunity. We have a breakout session after this session, so we can still uh, go on with the discussion. But uh, it is about the image. When I saw the film, a beautiful film, about the Faroe Islands here earlier today, do you know how many women were in, the, in that film? <laughs> Only one, and she was the pregnant one. There were, there were just men in the film, so it's about the image, it's about representing itself. 30 seconds. Yeah. I think we should take this opportunity, and thank you for coming here, to, to uh, start a more um, focused collaboration with Iceland. You're so close, and you're, you're so much ahead. So I hope we can work together, and you, and you can uh, help us not only us, but others in the Arctic as well, get in the right direction. Thank you. Katrin? Well, I think we, uh, there's a challenge now to you. Let's put up, up our gender classes and use them uh, today. I'm not asking you for more, just like Eriko did, he used his gender classes, so I encourage you to do that today. Uh, and take a look at the different picture you see when you try uh, to get a glimpse of the genders of men and women and diversity uh, while you're listening, uh, looking at people, looking at pictures and so on. Very good challenge. Edgun, you get the last word and, and the first. <laughs> Thank you. I agree with uh, the other speakers about uh, that we are going to um, uh, get more statistics and, and, and more images of of these countries so we can compare uh, the state uh, at each other. And I also think image and, uh, and that um, we have talked about uh, different trades today and, and, and the industry, that the industry also uh, get interested in, in these things for the region to attract uh, female to come back and to work in the fields. I think that's very important uh, if I should uh, think about the film we saw today and that we, uh, of course, uh, shall work closer together. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for those uh, closing uh, thoughts. The overall question that this panel addressed was how gender equality and diversity best be promoted in the Arctic through policy and practice. And as uh, was mentioned, this discussion will continue in one of the breakout sessions later. Uh, but I think uh, we still have miles to go to uh, 
to reach or reflect both gender and cultural diversity in policy making in the Arctic. And as Catherine also said, uh, everybody should be included in thinking of this, but also acting on this because no one should be left behind. So I hope this panel uh, can represent a significant step in those miles that we have to walk. Uh, but it doesn't depend on this panel alone. It uh, depends on all of us. Thank you very much.